Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Lana Labonte and I am here to support, uplift, inspire, and hopefully that empowers you to be the best version you are meant to be of you. We are continuing on with Chapter 7 in the Invitation by Oriah Mountain Dreamer. Let's dive in. Beauty. I want to know if you can see beauty, even when it's not pretty, every day. And if you can source your own life from its presence. Mm -hmm. Mitch brings Sarah flowers, a magnificent bouquet of color, purple and scarlet gladiolas, exotic birds of paradise, and orange tiger lilies, all surrounded by fragrant bows of eucalyptus. He brings flowers every Friday evening when he comes to share the Shabbat meal. Sarah greets him at the door and receives the flowers into outstretched arms with exclamations of delight. A tiny, dark-haired woman, she buries her face in the flowers, reveling in their scent and shapes and colors, examining each blossom. She thanks Mitch again and again, telling him how wonderful he is, how sweet, how thoughtful, how cared for and special she feels. Mitch grins uncontrollably as Sarah kisses his cheek. You've changed, she says with real pleasure, stroking the front of his freshly laundered shirt. His ears turn red beneath the ends of his curling, still damp hair. Of course, he says quietly, I wanted to look. He hesitates, embarrassed. Nice for you. She reaches up on tiptoe to kiss him full on the mouth. You do. You look beautiful. Mitch walks to the table where I am sitting. A man of 39, he suddenly looks like a boy of 16. He is glowing, and I could swear that he has actually grown taller during this exchange. The wariness held in his shoulders from working all day at a job he dislikes is gone. His eyes are bright with confidence, and I know as I watch his eye follow Sarah's movements as she prepares the evening meal, that in this moment there is nothing he would not do if it would please this woman. Sarah recognizes the beauty this man brings her, and she is willing and able to receive it, to let it renew and rejuvenate her. And as she does, the beauty is multiplied. Mitch, fully received, feels something of his own beauty and has more to give. It sounds simple enough, and it is. But what is simple is not always easy. Sometimes, in our familiarity with the beauty of the landscape of our daily lives, we fail to see it. We forget to really take it in. We neglect to express our appreciation and really let it feed us. The Navajo have a prayer. May I walk with beauty before me. May I walk with beauty behind me. May I walk with beauty above me. May I walk with beauty below me. May I walk with beauty all around me as I walk the beauty way. What is this beauty that the Navajo seek? It is what pulls us toward life. It is what calls to us when we despair, seduces us into opening again and again to the possibility of love and laughter. It is the physical manifestation of the mystery, God, spirit, the divine, that surrounds and beckons to us every day of our lives. It is the life that chooses life. The Navajo prayer expresses our soul's desire to recognize and receive beauty, knowing that as we do so, we become co-creators of this beauty, of that which urges, live. Many spiritual paths, both traditional and new age, posit a hierarchy of beauty. If they give any recognition to the sacred as it is manifest physically, such acknowledgement is confined to the non-human natural world and relegated to a status below that of the purer beauty of the human spirit or mind. Often, being in physical form is seen as a trial, a burden to be endured, a time to learn vital lessons for the time when we can escape the limitations of our bodies and graduate to the higher, non-physical afterlife. I don't know what happens when we die, but I do know what happens when we live with this separation of spirit and matter. Beauty becomes merely physical packaging, and those with power define what is pleasing based on profitability and subjective preferences. It is easy to become cynical, 
about how the marketplace has used our desire for beauty to sell us a narrow version of what cannot be bought or sold. We know the costs of this, eating disorders, self-hatred, endless striving for physical perfection. It's tempting to protect ourselves from this manipulation by devaluing the physical as meaningless or less important than the emotional, mental, and spiritual. But this perpetuates the split that is so familiar. This separation of spirit and matter leaves us with a spirituality that lacks the vitality and fire of the physical, and expressions of our creativity and sexuality are cut off from the depths of our heart and meaning of our souls. Physicality is a gift. It lets us literally touch one another. I am not interested in theories or practices aimed at getting out of here. I do not want to focus on preparing to go to heaven or evolving into formlessness. I want to learn how to be here fully in this body, in this world. And I want to live in a world infused with the power of the erotic, physical sensation inseparable from heart and soul that calls us to live. When we live erotically, the meaning enfolded in our very cells is unfolded as we touch and are touched. This is beauty. Seeing beauty is not about narrowing our vision, designating only some of its manifestations as worthy. It means expanding our definition of beauty, suspending our judgments, and appreciating both the quiet joy of riding a bicycle along the lake and the raunchy glee of driving a cherry red sports car that hugs the open highway. It means accepting the truth of being a middle-aged woman as it is reflected in both the lines and sagging muscles of my face and belly and the shine of my eyes. Seeing beauty is about broadening our ability to recognize the interconnectedness of all manifestations of life and delighting in how the smells and sounds and tastes and sights that surround us conspire to draw us toward living fully. I want to touch the power of life-giving moisture and recognize the smell of the sea where it caresses the shore in the scent of my sweat, in the salt of my tears, in the slippery wetness that pours from between my soft thighs when I am well loved. I want to focus on my fingertips, on the shape and weight of my hand on blood and bone and a thousand nerve endings as I raise an apple to my mouth. Let the tip of my tongue slide on the round smooth firmness of the cool surface and feel the spray of juices as my teeth pierce the skin and enter the crisp flesh inside. I want to taste the weeks of rain and sun, the ripening on the tree, the labor of the farmer and the fruit picker, the journey of the men and women who bring fruit from grove to table. I want to receive the beauty that reminds me that there is no separation, that each act I live while I am fully awake cannot help but be both prayer and lovemaking. We find and are fed by beauty in the places where the truth pretty or hard, is revealed in physical form. Sometimes we need help and support to get to the truth. Several years ago, while facilitating a painting workshop, I urged a woman to paint what she felt about her mother's recent death. I knew she didn't want to and that she was angry at my nudging her toward it. I also knew that she would not be able to paint anything else, that she could not go around what was true. The painting that emerged had excruciating beauty in its stark truth. The haunting, terrified figure in the painting clung with bony fingers to a small purse, clutching to something that could no longer help her. None of us could say we liked the painting, but we could not tear our eyes away from the beauty it held. It simply was the truth. Our soul's longing calls truth to us. And even when this truth is hard, when the beauty it reveals is not pretty, our deep hunger for the truth is satiated and some tension deep within us is released. Anyone who has uncovered the lies of someone they love knows how the pain of betrayal comes mixed with the relief of finally being able to acknowledge what they have known but pulled away from for years. Finding and acknowledging the truth is not always easy. Sometimes, Often, we don't know what is true. 
Of all the phrases frequently used in the New Age movement, I think the one I dislike the most is, this is my truth. I have heard this phrase used to justify blatant self-importance, delusion, and disregard for others so often that I wince when I hear it. I understand what people are trying to say when they use it. It is a reminder that in our ordinary consciousness, we have no access to absolute truth, cannot claim that our way of seeing has a monopoly on knowledge or wisdom. It is an attempt to find our own inner authority, to resist giving over the authority in our lives to something external, church or state, family or business, all those voices that profess to know what is best for us. But in a legitimate effort to claim authority in our own lives, we forget that there is reality beyond our limited perception, if not objective at the very least, intersubjective. If I get up tomorrow and see two suns shining in the sky, the first thing I will do is ask someone else what they see. If they do not see two suns, I will probably go to the eye doctor, assuming something is wrong with my eyes. I will not insist that my truth involves there actually being two suns in the sky. We can be and sometimes are wrong. Knowing this, we can create community where we can check to see if our perceptions have any intersubjective truth. Of course, ultimately, we must decide which perceptions we will grant validity. But to insist that my truth and your truth have no meeting place, that I do not need to consider other perspectives, to be unable to imagine that I may be wrong about what I think or see or feel at any given time, is to invite narcissistic mayhem. Nowhere is this more prevalent and dangerous than in the psychological and spiritual communities that focus on personal growth. I am often discouraged to see intelligent men and women suddenly put their thinking minds on hold and accept unfounded conclusions without evidence or explanation. There are truths that cannot be proven by empirical sensory data, but we risk wandering far from any truth if we do not at least ask ourselves honest questions. Did anyone else see the flash in the sky that you took to be a UFO? Why do you think that the voice that came during meditation was the wise guidance of a spirit guide external to yourself? Are there any other possible explanations? It is easy to fool ourselves into believing the most exciting story. I want to ask the people who profess to know that their beliefs are true, how they know this. I also want to ask the people who maintain that others' beliefs are impossible, how they can be so sure. I've had dreams that have included information, names, dates, places, and events. I can historically verify information I could not have known from my waking life. Are these past life memories? They could be, or they could be the result of somehow tapping into a collective unconscious or being given something from spirit. I don't know. What I do know is that these dreams feel important. So I explore why these stories of all possible stories come to me, what they may have to show me about living fully. I want to unfold their meaning, uncover their particular beauty, the truth they hold that helps me live right now. I have faith in the truth, in its ability to find us. One of the warm-up exercises I often have workshop participants do is to write a lie, as if it were true about why they are in the group. People go to great lengths to concoct elaborate lies, and we have great fun sharing the stories. But more often than not, no matter how far away from the facts of their life each person has gone in their story, some truth emerges about why they are there. The woman who writes that she is from Jupiter reveals her feeling of always being the outsider. The man who tells us he is an undercover cop often feels he is a fraud or a phony, secretly using others for covert purposes. If the truth often seems elusive when we seek it directly, 
perhaps it is some consolation that it also relentlessly reveals itself to us in our lives, our dreams, and the stories we tell one another. It is gratitude that expands my ability to receive beauty in my life. Lately, as I step into the shower each morning, I say a prayer of gratitude for the abundance of hot water that pours over my body, and I ask the water spirits to cleanse my heart as my body is washed. I am awed at the fortune in my life when I think of how, in most times and places, only a privileged few, the wealthiest, the most powerful, have been able to afford this pleasure that most ordinary people in developed countries take for granted. The gratitude I feel opens me to the small moment of beauty in my life. There are thousands of moments like this in our lives every day, and it is often our awareness of the truth in others' lives that enables us to appreciate beauty when it is offered. Watching a disabled friend labor to cross a room with small, slow steps reminds me to be aware of and grateful for the strength of my legs, the effortless way I move. The story on the news of the woman whose son has been killed in a drive-by shooting makes me grateful for my sons, for their laughter at the dinner table. The truth of her bottomless sorrow calls me to a greater patience with messy rooms and neglected homework. And if I am fully with the truth, I am able to receive and be fed by the beauty in both my friend's pain and perseverance and the grieving mother's courage. This is how death, the inevitable cycle of change in our lives, becomes our ally. Our anticipated loss of what we take for granted reminds us of what is precious, of what matters and what does not, of the meaning and pleasure of being in physical form. Tell me, can you see beauty? Can you let it renew your commitment to life every day? I don't want to wait for death to be near to receive the beauty in my life. I want to be awed every day by the truth, pretty or painful and let it open me to the beauty that surrounds me and draws me deeper and deeper into my own life. Hmm. Meditation on gratitude. Sit or lie in a comfortable position. Bring your attention to your breath. Following the inhalation and the exhalation as it moves in and out of your body. Be aware of your belly rising and falling. Let go with each exhalation. Send your breath into the places in your body where there is tiredness or tension and let it melt away with the exhalation. Let thoughts drift away, gently bringing your attention to your breath. Now, be aware of the physical abilities you have. Imagine your breath flowing into the parts of your body that come to mind. One at a time, Sending appreciation with your breath into these parts of your body. Breathe into your feet and legs, gratitude for their shape, their sensation, their abilities that you so often take for granted. Breathe into your hands and be aware of all they do each day.
Breathe into the places in your body that give you pleasure. The places that let you touch or be touched by another, that offer you the taste or smell or sight or sound of that which brings you pleasure. Breathe your gratitude into these places one at a time. Breathe into the internal organs that keep you alive. the heart that beats steadily. The lungs that replenish your body, breathing out toxins, breathing in life-giving oxygen. Remember your digestive organs that nourish and strengthen your body without any thought on your part, breathing your gratitude into them. Breathe into your face, becoming aware of the bones, the muscles, the skin, feeling the shape of the face by which you are known. Let yourself appreciate the beauty that is there. Take in the stories of life that are told in the lines and shape and texture and color of your face. Now, let your mind remember the parts of your body of which you are critical, the parts that are not the way you would like them to be, and the parts that are ill or disabled. Breathe into them. Breathe them into your heart with appreciation for how they are also a part of who you are. Move your attention now to your immediate surroundings, keeping one part of your attention on your breath. Breathe in whatever beauty is around you and breathe out your gratitude for this beauty. Breathe in the color, the temperature, the shapes around you, those that are pleasing and those that are harder to appreciate. Breathe out gratitude for the variety, for the time and the space to do this meditation. Move your attention to the people in your life, past and present. Breathe in the essence of what they have offered to you, that which has been easy and that which has been difficult. Breathe out your gratitude for them. When you are ready, 
bring your attention back to the breath as it moves in and out of your body. Moving your fingers and toes, offering a prayer of gratitude for life itself and being fully present. And that concludes chapter seven, beauty. See you in the next chapter.